Okay, everybody. So why don't we get started? My name is Joyce Raimondo. I'm the education coordinator at the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center in East Hampton, New York. We're a national landmark located about 100 miles east of New York City. And we have a special program today um, highlighting our current exhibition that just opened. It's called Creative Exchanges. And we have our curators, Teresa Davis and James Bauer, who are going to uh, lead a discussion about the works in the exhibition and also how the exhibition idea developed. So they'll tell you about that. Um, before we get to that, I wanna just give you a very quick walkthrough just to show you the beautiful property and also a little walkthrough of the gallery setting. And then James and Teresa will discuss the works using screen share on a, a slide presentation, okay? So um, let me just take you outside. It is the most spectacular day in uh, East Hampton, New York. And I think when I go outside, you'll be able to see why so many artists moved here. The light is spectacular. And um, we're on the property of the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center, as I said. And um, if you look directly ahead, you will see way back there, there's a water view of Akabana Creek. And James will tell you about the museum that was planned um, with Pollock and um, an architect to be right there. He's going to share that with you later. And um, we have the now famous barn situated right here where Pollock and Krasna made their famous abstract expressionist paintings. You can walk directly into the barn and walk on the floor where Pollock painted his uh, iconic drip paintings. Originally, the barn was here and they, the uh, Pollock moved it over here so as to not block that beautiful view. And then of course we have the um, house that they lived in. They moved here in 1945. Uh, this area was a haven for artists because the light is spectacular. We're surrounded by bays and oceans. And also we're in close proximity to New York City. And at that time in the 1940s, a so-called Bohemian artist uh, could move here. It was affordable. Um, the land was readily available. They bought all this property with a down payment loan from Peggy Guggenheim for $5,000. So this was really an area where artists congregated and they came in waves. Pollock and Krasner and their group, so to speak, uh, are known as abstract expressionists. And they created a groundbreaking art that put America on the art capital of the world. And this exhibition is so good. I'm just gonna give you a little walkthrough. Uh, what James and Teresa did is they took the um, names of people from Lee Krasner's address book and um, they collected artworks from these people. And it really makes the idea come alive that um, this group um, of creative people, that they were real people, right? In her address book, there was an intimate connection. There were friendships. There was an exchanging of creative ideas. So it's a play on words, creative exchanges. If English is not your first language and exchange can also be a way of saying a phone number. And so let me start, um, I'm just gonna do a quick walkthrough of this gallery. Some of the objects are always here, like this sculpture right here by Ronald Stein, Lee Krasner's nephew. And um, some of the paintings that you see on the wall um, are just for this current exhibition, okay? So let's start right here. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it on my computer, but here's a case with the actual address books. This is the old fashioned address books, of course, before cell phones, um, before digitization, where people just hand wrote notes in their, in, in their contacts in these phone books. And we're gonna hear from James and Teresa later as to how they discerned which artists to choose for the exhibition. And then of course, on the walls, we have selected pieces um, by artists who are really icons of abstract expressionists, such as Mark Rothko. 
Uh, some of the pieces we were unable to obtain. So we have replicas such as this one of Barnett Newman. And you will see all the names of the great artists, James Brooks, John Little, whose house is, um, his barn studio down the street is also a public site now as well. Uh, Helen Frankenthaler. And we're gonna go over this later on the PowerPoint. You'll be able to see it very accurately. So I'm not gonna name every single artist. I'm just giving you an overview. This piece is beautiful. It's made with sand casting. And that is uh, Constantina Novola, um, Adolf Gottlieb, Paul Jenkins. This is a beautiful acrylic on canvas. It's amazing. And um, here we have Vita Peterson, Mercedes Matter, who founded the New York Studio School. Directly in this showcase, this is really poignant. These are some different items that friends of Pollock and Krasnick gave to them. And one of the most touching ones to me is right here. It's the serenity prayer, which of course is the prayer of AA, God grant me the serenity. And um, I was told by Helen Harrison that that was the a prayer that Pollock actually hung in his studio. And sadly, he wound up dying of alcoholism, even though he had that prayer posted in his, his barn studio. It's very sad, actually. Um, and of course, Charles Pollock was also an artist, uh, Jackson Pollock's brother. Alfonso Sorio, a very close friend of Pollock. Okay, so this is a beautiful piece um, made up of pigmented cement on board. It's very textured. It's by Jean Renal. I love this exhibition also because it's so nostalgic of that era to see these materials and a lot of found objects that the artists were working with. And um, John Graham. This is the parlor. So I'm not going to name all the artists because we're going to go through them later. Um, Thomas Hart Benton, of course, was Pollock's teacher early on at the Art Students League. This is really interesting. John Mert, who made this piece, his ashes are actually in the backyard. He, his ashes were buried under those stones that I showed you when I was outdoors. And, and this is a couple and beautiful uh, natural landscapes. And on this wall, we have uh, three of Pollock's, well, friends and his brother from when he was younger, Rudin, Ru, Ruben Kadish, Sanford McCoy, who was his brother, and um, Philip Gustin, who are now all very, very famous artist. Not so much Sanford, but the other ones. And uh, Teresa and James also highlighted some sculptures, which is amazing. And I can't wait to hear from them. I have so many questions. I'm sure you will too. And at the end, if we have time, I'll bring you upstairs. Okay. So on that note, I would like to introduce uh, James and Teresa. I'm going to spotlight them. Um, so James Bauer and Teresa Davis are the co-curators of this exhibition. Teresa Davis is on our staff. She's the assistant to the director, Helen Harrison. And um, my first question is for James. Can you tell us how the idea for this exhibition evolved or just how did it arise rather? Sure, uh, it was relatively simple. <laughs> Uh, I was standing in the office talking to Helen and she just said, oh, we have the uh, address book that Lee Krasner had. Um, and I looked at it and then I, then I went home and I looked, I sort of did a little Googling around and I found that two more address books were owned by the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian in 2015 had 
created an exhibit of artists' address books, just the address books, nothing more than that. But what I was able to do with the Smithsonian website was flip through the pages and I could see there that all the, or many of the people were in fact, the famous artists, writers, art critics, museum directors of the time. So the next logical step was to say, let's create an, an exhibition all, of all of them. Uh, and then what I did, and, and you'll be able to see it on the website, we took all three of the address books and created a, a monstrous data, not a monstrous, but a database of all of the, of all of the people, uh, their, where they lived, uh, their telephone numbers, um, and that was it initially. So we then had something like 400 separate people, everyone ranging from Lee Krasner's housekeeper to the restaurant where she went to get takeout food to Helen Frankenthaler. Um, so we had that huge file and, and that took an incredible amount of time because we had to decipher both Lee's writing and Jackson Pollock's writing. I mean, if you think they're good artists, they weren't, they weren't good handwriting people. Mm -hmm. um, so we, that, that took an, an awful lot of time to create, create that database. Um, but so now the database actually exists online. So if you go to the website, you can you know, look at the database and you can say, um, show me all of the artists, show me all of the writers, okay? And okay. the other thing we did is with the, the database. What is, what is the website? What's, which website? It's, it's the, uh, either, either through create, creative exchanges is, or it's on the Paula Kratner website as well on PK House. So it, it's there. Uh, and so you can pick, you can sort by any of those items uh, and say, show me all of the, show me all of the artists. Show me the artists who were in all three of the address books, which signifies that they were really, you know, they were good friends of Pollock, well, of, of Krasner, because she survived him uh, over, you know, the entire period of time from the 40s through to the 50s and maybe even into the 60s. Um, so we've created really a whole separate way to look at and think about the people that were in the address books outside of, you know, the art. Um, and just to take that one step further in the catalog, which is also online, Helen wrote thumbnail sketches of all of the artists and really emphasized what the relationships were between the people because they either were friends of Pollock and Krasner from Greenwich Village in the city or they had moved out to East Hampton. Thank you. And now we're going to sure. hear from Teresa Davis. So, this amazing idea, you know, is sparked. And now you have this database. Okay, so now we have this huge database. And where do you go from there? How do you develop this? <laughs> How we went from there was, this was about a year in the making. I think we started last July having meetings of looking at the database, looking at these many, 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 many artists that were written in their books. Um, deciphering, as James said, uh, who the artist's names were and then putting them in that chart. And then we had to really narrow it down because out of the 75 visual artists that we had, um, as some of you know that have visited the Pollock House, we have a very small space inside the uh, downstairs portion of the house where we can hang a show. So from the 75 visual artists, we had to narrow it down to some 30 plus artists so we can exhibit their work. And we really had to focus on who were their better friends, their most influential teachers, uh, their 
family members who were also artists. And from that, we really put together a homecoming, if you will, of artists, family, friends, locals, um, who represented their, their whole group of friends between um, around the early 50s all the way through the 60s. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And we'll take time for, I'm sure people will have a lot of questions later about how the exhibition developed and maybe, you know, just what surprises or challenges you met. We'll discuss that later. So I'm going to talk about something called the Ideal Museum that was created by uh, a friend of Jackson Pollock, a guy by the name of Paul Blake who was at that time in, in the late 40s, a relatively famous architect. Um, and he was part of the, or worked in the International School of Architecture, which included people like Mies van der Rohe and Philip Johnson at that time period. So this first screen, the first picture is what Joyce showed you earlier, looking out the back of the Pollock Krasner house to, in the background, Akabana Creek, um, in, the, in the middle ground, a foundation where the studio used to be, and in the front ground, um, the, the rocks that we'll talk about. And that's the location where uh, Paul Brock wanted to put this museum uh, dedicated exclusively to Pollock's work. It was was a purpose-built building in that international style, okay? This is perhaps the most famous uh, building of that style. This is the Philip Johnson House in New Canaan, Connecticut. It's called the Glass House. And you can see, you know, it's, it's only glass walls with a structure. And it's also following on from the Bauhaus theory of form follows function, okay? So that, that's really the foundation for what Blake proposed. This is, and Blake worked a lot in the Hamptons. Uh, there are still a number of his houses that are there and you could see how he transferred the sort of the Philip Johnson international style into residential structures. Think of the first picture, which was the, you know, the view from the house. This is a view of what the museum, the ideal museum would have looked like in that spot had Paul Blake in fact built it. Uh, and what we did in the museum for this e exhibition was took a picture of a model that had been built of the Ideal Museum, um, just sort of a head on shot and put it on a piece of glass and then put it in the window that was formerly Lee Krasner's studio that overlooked the backyard. So if you come to see the exhibit, go and perhaps Joyce will go up on the, you know, later in the, in the tour. If you go up there, you stand right in front of the window look through the little plastic piece that we created of the museum itself out to see what it would have looked like. Now the question is, right, uh, and this wasn't built because of the cost of it, uh, would, would the backyard and the environment look better with this museum plopped in there or does it look better the way it is now? And I have an opinion on it but I'd be interested in everyone else's opinions. Let's take a little bit of a deeper look at it on the next slide. This is a picture of obviously Pollock on the left and Paul Blake on the right, looking at the model of the museum, okay? And just think if you're Pollock and you know his ego, and this was in 1949 when he was at the peak of his drip painting uh, you know, career, uh, all of a sudden you'd have this, you know, beautiful purpose-built museum to your works sitting in the backyard. Um, 
Anyway, we'll look at the next slide and we will see what it would have looked like from the inside. Uh, so that's, you know, sort of an overview looking down. There would have been, I think, a glass roof on the top, which obviously was never built. Uh, so plenty of light would have come in and you could see Pollock's works and literally walk around them and sort of be as, you know, the way he painted them, he was enveloped in the works. Here where you'd go through the museum and you would almost be in the works themselves. And that's sort of a ground level view of what one of the, you know, proposed pictures in the museum would look like. So anyway, if you come to see the exhibit itself, head right up to the second floor, go into Lee's studio and, and look at, you know, through the window at the museum. And then after we're done with this, we can have a discussion about whether the backyard looks better the way we showed you in the picture, the first picture, or would it have looked better with the museum? And now we'll turn it over to Teresa. Okay, Teresa, you want to tell us about John Little? Yes, I um, I am so thrilled to talk about this little piece. We own this piece. This was a wedding gift that John Little, who you see on the left, had given to Jackson and Lee um, for their wedding. Or sorry, John Little gave to Jeffrey Potter and Priscilla Bowden when they got married. Uh, eventually, Priscilla gave this to us as a gift to the Pollock House. And so we own this little 10 by 12 painting. We've had this in a number of other shows before, and I've always been drawn to it. It is a tiny little exquisite painting with bold color and layered on top of one another. And I don't know why it's always spoken to me, but I'm so happy to be talking about it now. Um, he took classes. He, he was initially a textile designer and um, he was known for his gestural work filled with bold expressive color reflecting the influence of his teacher Hans Hoffman and his involvement with the abstract expressionist movement of East Hampton. Uh, he grew up in um, where am I? In Alabama. He was born in 1907. And both of his parents died when he was very young. And at 14 years old, he decided to move to Buffalo to study art at the Buffalo Fine Arts Academy. He had to earn a little money for himself initially. And at, 20, at 1924, at age 17, he studied applied design and eventually switched to fine art. And for his second year there, he received a scholarship. Um, while he was at the academy, he was exposed to the influences of Hans Hoffman and later would be working with him. In 1927, when he was 20, he also discovered that he had quite a singing voice and he moved to New York City for vocal training. So this guy was multi-talented. Um, he was introduced to a textile designer who had his own business. And he began doing odd jobs uh, to earn money. And he discovered that he really enjoyed some of the odd jobs around the textile industry. And he started freelancing and doing his own independent work. In 1929, he opened the John Little Studio, fabric and wallpaper design. And that continued all the way through 1950. 1930s were huge years for him. 1933, he decided to start working and resume his art training at the Art Students League and studied under George Grove. Uh, he started painting landscapes that revealed incipient modernism. Uh, and in 1937, he met Lee at the Hoffman School and they became lifelong friends. He really gained a lot by studying under Hoffman, learning his theories and exposure to European modernism and absorbed Hoffman's essential ideas that painting is an abstraction 
of what the artist views directly from nature. Push and pull theory in which 3D natures is translated to 2D painting by means of tensions between space, form, and color. After serving in World War II, he was still living in New York City and he couldn't find housing at that time. And uh, he moved into Hoffman's 8th Street studio and Jackson and Lee were his next door neighbors. Uh, this is an example of uh, an announcement for one of his uh, wallpaper designs. And as you can see, he's looking directly at nature. He's using bold colors. He's learned the push-pull method of using colors to recede um, and come forward from Hans Hoffman. Here's another example of a wallpaper design uh, inspired from nature. Exquisitely drawn flowers and leaves translating 3D nature to 2D canvases by creating strong linear framework and color um, by using the special sense through warm and cool interrelationships. Again, this is an example of one of his wallpapers called Textured Leaves. He's looking at the structure and, insp and inspired by nature, but using warm and cool push-pull methods that he learned from Hoffman. Here he is in 1948. Um, he had been visiting Jackson and Lee since he had met them in the city. And in 1945, when they moved out here, he had been coming out and visiting them periodically. In 1948, uh, Lee directed him to a rundown farmhouse on Three Mile Harbor Road. And he purchased that, renovated, and moved the old Edwards barn, which was more or less uh, closer to East Hampton proper, and used that for his studio. Three years later, Josephine and John moved out here permanently. Here he is uh, shown picking up different uh, objects that interested him on the beach. And he started using those objects in his art from that point and started making collages and assemblages. Here he is in the barn, um, contemplating perhaps a work that he's begun or a next work that he might be thinking about doing. This is an example of one of his assemblages called Image from the Sea, 1954, a mixed media assemblage. So he was finding uh, different shapes, different pieces of um, wood, different pieces of objects that he liked, and he combined those in his paintings. This is called uh, Personages, pers Personage in 1954. And again, it's put together with different found objects that interested him and uh, started doing these collages. This picture I love because you don't often see Jackson kind of smiling and enthusiastic. And I think there's a, a real warmth and friendship between Jackson and Lee and John. And here he is in John Little's studio about 1955. And this final slide shows uh, John Little, Elizabeth Parker, Alfonso Sorio, and a uh, gallery assistant, John Hawkins. The three of them, uh, John Hawkins worked within the gallery, but John Little, Elizabeth Parker, and Osorio were the three partners that started the Signa Gallery. And the Signa Gallery was uh, representing and exhibiting avant-garde art in East Hampton. And that's the last of my slides, but I just want to say that uh, the John Little property is now called the Art Center at Duck Creek. It's a nonprofit art center highlighting art, music, sculpture, and other cultural activities. It's located on Three Mile Harbor Road and Squaw Road right on the John Little property. So it's a wonderful, wonderful, casual um, cultural art center that um, is another addition to our Springs neighborhood.
Okay, we're changing gears completely at this point. Um, on the right hand side of the screen is a painting that was done by Lee Krasner with her psychiatrist, Dr. Leonard Siegel in 1956. And sort of a little bit of background, both Pollock and Krasner had psychiatrists or psychologists in the city and they would regularly drive in from East Hampton when they lived out there to Manhattan, stay overnight in a hotel and have their respective sessions with their psychiatrists, psychologists, whatever. Uh, and this particular painting came to us from Dr. Siegel's daughter in the year 2008. And we don't have the painting, but she sent Helen an email with the, uh, an image of this, of this work explaining that on the back of it, it said 1956 and that it was done by Siegel and Lee. And L Siegel was not only Lee's psychiatrist, but he had a house or out in East Hampton and they were friends. Okay, so that's, that's the background of it. The question is, what does that represent? And for that, we looked at a biography of Lee Krasner uh, and there's an interpretation there which recounts a story that after one of those sessions that Lee had with Siegel, she went back to the hotel where Jackson was and Jackson sees her and, um, and says, Lee, what's wrong? Um, Lee, Lee is obviously visibly upset. And Lee recounts that as a child, she had terrible dreams and memories of a monster living in the basement uh, or in the cellar of her house. And somehow by working with Siegel, on this particular painting, that represents the end of her dream or her thoughts about the monster in the basement. Uh, so that's their interpretation. I have different interpretations of it um, before we found the, the Gail Levin quote in the bio autobiography. And I go back to the fact that it was dated 1956. And that was the year, obviously, that Jackson died in, in the car accident. And my interpretation would be that this was done after his death. And we know that she was clearly very upset by it, as, as you'd expect. And the picture on the left, which hangs in the studio, is Lee after Jackson died, about three weeks afterwards, and at that point, she you know, explained that she was really crying and weeping inside. So my interpretation of it is the, the figure on the left-hand side represents Lee. It, it looks like a woman's image or a woman's, woman's body. Over the, the, or the writing along the bottom, you can almost make out a J and the rest of it would be Pollock's signature and the white, uh, spot and the symbols above it is is Jackson in the car accident. Now that may be overly simplistic, but that's that again is my interpretation of it. Um, and I'm not going to argue with Gail Levin, who's her biographer, but that's what I bring to it. Uh, and we can talk about this afterwards. And I'll give it back to Teresa at this point. So now I'm happy to talk about uh, Ruth Navola. And uh, another one of the pieces that we have in the show, this is called Ritual Choker between 1977-1979. Um, on the left, we see a picture of Ruth and Tino, her husband. And you could kind of make, up, make out Claire kind of huddled in Ruth's lap and her other child, Pietro, sitting on the... Um, sitting on the wall of the outside 
um, fireplace. This is in Springs. And um, so now I'll back up and give you a little bit of history of who Ruth was, how they ended up in Springs, how they were friends of Pollock and Krasner. But if you could see, when you come see the show at the Pollock House, this is such an exquisite piece of jewelry that she started making these, these structures or these body ornaments after Claire, her daughter, and Pietro were out of the house after they were finished with college. And I'll tell you why she was always working with her hands. So now I'll back up a little bit and um, tell you a little bit about her life and um, when she was born. Uh, she was born Ruth Guggenheim in Munich, Germany, on January 12th, 1917, to an assimilated German Jewish family. Um, when she was six years old, her father was alarmed at the attempted coup by Hitler and wanted to make sure his family was safe. And so he moved the whole family to Baden-Baden in the Black Forest of Germany and then eventually to Turin to a villa overlooking the Alps. Uh, Ruth began, she was about this time, she was eight or nine years old and she began school for the first time at a convent school. And she was taken to a spa and contracted typhoid fever. She became seriously, seriously ill she was bedridden for a year, had to learn how to walk all over again. She was quarantined and the only people that she could be exposed to was her mother and the nurse in the uh, hospital. Uh, this nurse kind of focused Ruth and entertained her by bringing dead rhododendron leaves and hitting them with, um, with brushes on either side until the dead uh, parts of the leaf fell off and all that remained was the structure of the leaf. And from that point, uh, when the, the dead parts of the leaves fell away, she started teaching Ruth how to embroider with silk thread. Claire, her daughter, who I had the utmost pleasure of meeting, said that her mother learned patience either through that nurse or perhaps she was born with it. But she was always gentle, loving, kind, and patient. And she doesn't remember her mother in any other way other than that description. Um, her, her grandfather wanted to take the whole family back to Germany thinking the worst was over, they can get back to their homeland. He really loved the uh, German philosophy and music and, um, and art. And so he moved the family back to Germany. And when Ruth was about 17, she was in school and she started hearing wind that there was a whole anti-Semitism movement going on. And uh, she alerted her, her parents again. And they really didn't want to move, but they did eventually listen to Ruth and uh, they moved again, this time going to Milan where an uncle of Ruth's was living. Uh, Ruth enrolled in art school when they were in Milan and at the art school, she met her future husband, Costantino Nivola. He was from Sardinia and they fell madly in love. The Guggenheim family, however, uh, was very prominent and they were not thrilled to have their daughter um, together with this very poor Sardinian artist. And uh, they tried everything they could to get her away from him. They tried to dissuade her from this union by sending her to the Olivetti uh, company. It was pretty close to Milan. And uh, Ruth lasted just a few weeks and wanted to come home to be near Tino. Then her parents tried another tactic, sent her to Paris for fashion design school because Ruth was very interested in fashion. And so they sent her to fashion design school where Tina followed her. And um, 
they really could not separate the two. And uh, in 1938, Ruth and Constantine married and they moved to America and arrived in New York City in July of 1939. They had very little money. They were existing on very little. Um, he was, what was he doing? He was hired in a factory. Ruth was hired as a nanny. He started making cards and taking them around to different department stores, hoping they would hire him. It was a good tactic because they did eventually hire him as an art director. And then Ruth went to work for, um, for a leather company. And um, she started learning how to make handbags and belts and uh, became very, very good with her hands. But once they, try the next slide. I think we might be on the next slide, Joyce. Here we are um, in 19, early 1940s. They moved out of the city and he, Tino was already uh, hired as an art director and they started growing their family. There's Claire sitting on Ruth's lap and Tino in the background with his father. And they moved here to Springs on Old Stone Highway. And, um, and Claire, I mean, excuse me, Ruth was, the word that comes to my mind with Ruth from reading everything and hearing things about her is she was devoted. And devoted not in any um, uh, dogmatic sense, but while she was raising her family, she was devoted to her children, her husband, the family. She started knitting hats, gloves, scarves, ties, baskets, um, anything that would bring her closer and show her love for her family. Um, she really didn't start making these structures or sculptural jewelry until the kids were out of the house, actually even done with college. And she then at that point, as many mothers do when there's an empty nest syndrome, <laughs> figures, you know, what is my next step now? What do I do with myself now? So she started going down to um, the lower streets in Manhattan and started exploring some of the shops that had like very unusual and interesting threads and yarns. And um, she found some threads that were silver and gold and she started crocheting. And from that crocheting with this silver and gold, she then found her next, um, her next calling really. And as reading some of her information about her, as I said, she was devoted. She was not only devoted to her family, her husband, her children, but when she started working with these threads, she was looking to nature. She was looking very closely at nature, looking at seeds and the structure of grass, the structure of Queen Anne's lace, um, things that inspired very fine design. And she started weaving that into her crocheted works. Um, Dory Ashton made a comment about Ruth and said, everything around Ruth bears the mark of an exceptionally delicate sensibility. She had an aesthetic will that saturated everything around her. Her grandson, Adrian, remembers walking in the woods with her, and she would notice everything. Blades of grass, seed pods, acorns, wisteria pods. She not only observed the natural forms, but she was inspired by the natural forms. She also remembered going to Etruscan museums when she was a child in Rome and visually recalling Etruscan jewelry. She was inspired by ancient and contemporary art and cultures, colors from Persian and Indian miniature paintings, and structure and repetition of forms in traditional Sardinian costumes, 
where Tina was from. She was inspired to create ornaments rather than pretty objects. She strove to elevate art by creating pieces that echoed simplicity and the complex forms of the flora and fauna surrounding her. Um, certain pieces were tribally inspired while others echoed ancient Pompeian frescoes or the lyricism of trees and branches or music. Certain pieces evoked a specific remembrance of a person. She was exhibiting and showing nationally and internationally through the American Craft Museum, they organized a show that traveled to the US, Russia, Europe, and Turkey. She was universally received, highly acclaimed. She was written about in leading periodicals and craft books, such as A Jeweler's Art. She, the word devotion comes up again for me. She wasn't interested in art that was flashy, that was going to make this statement. She was interested in things that touched back to nature, touch back to cultures uh, related to history and uh, ancient art. She was searching for true meaning of beauty, not decorative beautification. I want to close um, with another comment by Patsy Southgate in regards to her work. And she said, the drive to adornment is as basic as the will to art. Each piece had its wit, was exquisite in its originality, and referred to the natural world, ancient art, and culture. And I just want to say one last thing. Her husband, Tino, died in 1988. And when he died, she stopped making these necklaces or this body art uh, because he took great pride in naming each one of her pieces when she would make it. So when he died, she kind of closed that time of her, um, of her adornments. Oh, there's another one. Siren's Anchor, 1978. Beautiful. Here, oh, here she is as an older woman in her backyard. And um, so many people I spoke to says they remembered Ruth with just so much life and so much vitality. And you could see that in her face. Um, just as her grandson was talking about her, he was saying she just, she expressed such joy in the simplest things when she would be walking through the woods and talking to him, just the shape of things and how that made her feel and how she could translate that into her art making. So um, she's a great inspiration. And I hope that you might look at um, further things on the on YouTube channels. There is a terrific, terrific um, interview with Alicia Longwell that's, inter she's talking to Claire Navola, her daughter, Adrian Navola, her grandson, and another woman who's an art historian talking about um, Ruth Nivola, but it's chock full of information. I've only scratched the surface of what Ruth is all about, but please come see these pieces. They are so special. So right now, um, you can see behind me, this is the small room upstairs where Jackson Pollock painted the first year that they moved here and then Lee used this as her studio. Um, until 1956. Then after Jackson's death, uh, Lee eventually moved into the barn. And so let's, let's, let's have some fun with this. There's the mini museum there in the window. And let me see if I could line this up. This was quite clever. So if I line this up, it, wait a minute, let me get a good angle here. Yeah, it just about lines up with where it would have been. If you're here in real life, you can, it's a little easier to line it up, but you can get the idea of how the remarkable light would have come through this architectural structure. Yeah, I see that Roy has a question about if the museum could have been done in a way to be in harmony with nature 
and not compete with it. Um, I think possibly if it were smaller and not directly blocking the view, um, perhaps somewhere else on the property, or instead of being directly across the front, uh, sort of along the side a little bit, but that would have not given it that, you know, beautiful vista out on the on the, on the creek. See, I don't really think it competes with nature myself. Everybody sees things differently. I think the horizon, because it's so long and horizontal, it kind of mimics the yard. And then because so much of it is transparent, it kind of expresses the light. And then because Jackson Pollock's painting have such a feeling of the energy of nature, I feel like it actually expresses the site quite well. But everybody sees things differently. That's what makes the world go around. So let me, um, let I got the slides now. So let me show you these wonderful works of art that we have on view here. And this is the actual phone in the house, which is always on display. This is also permanently on display in Lee Krasner's bedroom. Igor Pontanov was her boyfriend before Pollock. This is also on permanent display. Lorraine says, Ruth sounds like a lovely human being. I, I agree. The pieces are so beautiful and delicate, Mika says. Um, did we cover why the museum was never built, James? It was primarily because of cost. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us about the painting Pollock did in treatment with his psychiatrist? And was there an issue of who owned it? The paintings were part of his treatment. That's a very, very good question. Um, can anyone speak to that? Or 
it's outside of the scope of the exhibition itself. I think the idea is that um, there's been questions of ethics if someone goes to a psychiatrist and does drawings to speak about their dreams and their subconscious, and it's a very personal, um, you know, confidence. And then when that person dies, if they're really famous and those drawings are in the hands of the psychiatrist, is it ethical to then reveal them? I think that's the question I take it that you're getting at. It's beyond the scope of my expertise what the answer is, but it's a very good question. Any thoughts on that? We actually considered that um, with this particular work um, and thought several things. Um, one, uh, they were both dead. We made a really good faith effort to contract to contact Dr. Siegel's daughter um, and were unable to find her. She apparently had moved to Australia. Uh, and she had written in the email that you know that they were friends and she had if she could have you know released it uh, on behalf of her father at that point so that was the logic that we used and aside from which i don't think the hipaa requirements existed at that point mm, good point um lorraine says are any of the artists related how did they all succumb to be part of the house? Or you meant, I think that was a typo. Um, yes, they were, some of them were related. And how did they all come to be part of the house? I think we covered that at the beginning. Um, anyone, Teresa, you wanna to speak to that? Any of these artists related? Yeah. yeah, I mean, specifically there was Charles Pollock, his old, uh, Jackson Pollock's oldest brother, who was directly, um, influenced Jackson to come out to New York City and study under Thomas Hart Benton. And there was Sandy Pollock, who um, was the brother right above Jackson, who ended up really caring for Jackson a lot when, when he wasn't so stable emotionally. And then the rest, those are the only two, three that are related, Jackson, Charles, and Sandy. The others are related in friendships, through schools that they had gone to, for instance, studying under Thomas Hart Benton, uh, going to the Hans Hoffman School. Um, uh, what else? Uh, the WPA, working on the WPA during the 30s, um, being friends and neighbors by being introduced to this area out in the Springs. Um, so they weren't these friends weren't related per se, but they certainly had a lot of influence on one another and a lot of inspiration and a lot of talks. Um, uh, Paul Jenkins really uh, was interested in Jungian philosophy. So was Jackson Pollock. Um, John Little studied the I Ching and Jungian philosophy. So, you know, different philosophies uh, overlapped, different aesthetics, um, the abstract expressionist culture, uh, moving out to the springs, all of that was interrelated to all of these artists. Mm -hmm. and so that's how we chose them to be in this show, because just like you and I end up meeting people and having friends, we end up being friends because we share some of the same ideas, some of the same values, some of the same philosophies. And these people did too. And, and like you said one time, just in passing, Teresa, if you, we become friends with people we went to school with, people we went to, to work, you know, worked with. Mm -hmm. And also to imagine the Springs community back then, it was very rural. And there were places where the artists could congregate. We have photos of the Navola, um, you know, with Pollock at the Springs General Store and Pollock would sit on the porch and they would go to beach parties. So also there was, you know, it was also fun. They would go to parties together, all that sort of thing. So we have a very good question that came in. Was Lee's work considered to be in the museum? Not that, that we know of but also put it in the context of time. This was 1949 and Jackson, you know, in the 45, 46 to 
49.50 time frame. That's when he did the drip paintings that were, you know, his most, you know, famous works. Um, and Lee at that point, right, didn't have the same notoriety that that he did. In fact, it wasn't it wasn't until the last 10 or 15 years that her image and identity has 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 ascended. Um, so, you know, and she spent a lot of time um, sort of promoting Jack. Mm -hmm. um, and Bonnie says, why did the women expressionists get attention? Um, what, why was it so hard for women expressionists to get attention? Um, I think there's a spelling error there. Um, I've been being appreciated. We don't have a ton of time. We have to close the talk soon. That's a big question. So anyone want to answer that in one or two sentences? Yeah, I think that's the way women were perceived at that point in time. And it wasn't until, you know, the 1970s or starting in the 1970s that, uh, that there was that level or increased recognition. And it's still going on today. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a bias. It's a gender bias that made it difficult for women in general to have professional lives, whether it was the arts or any other field. So actually, we... one other one other thing, very interesting. Uh, Lee studied with Hans Hoffman, right? And there's a very famous quote that said, that Hoffman said to her, "Your painting is pretty good for a woman." Mm -hmm. I would have thought that was done by a man. That's that was the whole quote. Yeah. Um, so you can imagine if her teacher and and was able to say that directly to her face, and she was a very good artist. Um, how that uh, also was lasted in the rest of the culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in the times. Yeah. Very good question, Bonnie. I hope you come back for other talks where we explore that issue in more depth. Now, my favorite question of the day is, did they have email back then? Now, I'm going to answer it by showing the phone. The reason it's my favorite question is because email really didn't come about for a common person until like, I think it was the mid-1990s. Um, and so I will show you the actual phone that I love because when the children come in on their tours, they're just fascinated. They're like, wow, how did you use it? This is the rotary phone for any of the young people out there. You pick up the handle and you dial the number like this, right? You dial rotary phone. Here is Jackson Pollock's and Lee Krasner's phone number written on the top. It's attached to the wall. And if you want to speak to someone, you call the operator if you need help. Okay, so that was the phone, no computers, no cell phones, no email, no internet. And everybody kept a paper, a paper address book. So great question. And for me, this whole exhibit is so nostalgic, even though I wasn't alive in that era. It really, when you come here, it brings you back to that era. And James and Teresa, you did an amazing job. This is such a huge job to even logistically gather these artworks by so many very well-known artists and the level of intricacy with communicating with the estates and the families, I can't even imagine it. And then physically putting this all together, two people also working together, which is just a wonderful, wonderful collaboration that people are gonna enjoy all summer. And second best is our virtual tour. So everybody give James um, Bauer and Teresa Davis a Zoom round of applause. Thank Yay. You. Is it gonna be here for the entire summer? The oh, July 30th. July 30th is, it will be up until July 30th. Mm -hmm. If you're in the area, Rita, you sign up. You have to sign up for tour pkhouse.org in advance. You can't just stop by. So plan out your trip if you'd like to come and see it in person. I think you would really enjoy it. And I know we have people from across the globe. So I hope this gives you a little flair for what this community is about and inspires you as well. So thank you again for taking the time.